Hello and welcome everyone. Hola y bienvenidos. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Mireya and I'll be your host. Here with me is Kenichi Ueda, the co-founder and co-director of iNaturalist. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone joining us on Zoom that although we'll, we'll be unable to take any live on-camera questions, you may utilize that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live right now, feel free to drop any questions that you may have in the comments section. In case you can't catch the entire program today, don't fret. We'll be recording this and you can find it on our social media accounts in the next few days. Hi, Kenichi, how are you today? I'm doing great, Maria. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited about this. For those that might not be familiar with iNaturalist, will you give us a rundown of this amazing tool? Sure, let me share my screen. Got some slides presented, ready. All right, can you see that? Yeah. Excellent. All right, um, first, thanks for having me. It's real great to talk to folks at Sonoma Land Trust and to anyone who's tuning in. I'm looking forward to having a bit of conversation. Um, hopefully, so definitely get your questions down if you if you've got any. Um, so yeah, for those who who aren't familiar with INAT, um, for one thing, we call it INAT for short, <laughs> but it's called iNaturalist, and I usually like to explain it with a bit of a kind of back and forth um, sort of discussion about various images in nature. Um, Never done this on Zoom before, so we're going to see how this happens, how this works. Uh, Maria and Lisa and Neil may have to serve as the audience and and answer answer my questions. But my first question for y'all is, what is this thing? Anybody? If we get a response, I'm not quite sure. It definitely looks like a caterpillar to me. <laughs> All right, caterpillar. What makes you think it's a caterpillar? Um, it's long shape. The antenna, the pro legs, and because what are, it's what are, what are pro legs? Um, I believe I'm using that term correctly, but um, I believe they're the legs that are after their front legs. Okay. Is that correct? No. <laughs> <laughs> We're teaching it's each other here. <laughs> Definitely looks does pretty anyone cool. Else have any, does anyone else have any guesses about what this might be? We'll give them a few seconds. And remember that you can drop off any comments that you have about what you think this might be in that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, or you can use that, um, you can comment on the Facebook video as well. Well, Maria, since I have you, why is this not a worm? Ah, uh, that's interesting. So to me, I didn't think it was a worm because I always think of worms without legs, okay. kind of like snakes that just kind of do the whole zigzaggy motion. Totally. Oh, it looks like we did get a response in the Q&A. Someone said, a pipe bind swallowtail caterpillar. And so someone... Yeah, <laughs> and someone else added, it has eyes. It has Whoa. eyes, okay, cool. That's awesome. a good observation. All right, those are good, good responses. So there are like a lot of worms that do have leg-like appendages. They're not like true legs. Oh. Um, most of them are marine um, and not terrestrial. So for this one, we can see it's on what looks like a plant, looks like it's on land. So we could probably exclude all you know, marine worms. I wish we had a bit more of a back and forth so I could ask this person why they think it's a pipe fine swallowtail specifically. Um, but if you'll forgive me, I might answer for them and just say, it's on a plant that if you know your local plants sort of looks like California pipe vine. So that's one indicator of why we might, we might think this is a pipe, a pipe vine swall swallowtail caterpillar. Okay, cool. Um, try this one more time. How about this one? What do people think this is or these are? And I am referring to the brown things in the middle and not the shriveled brown and green things in the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't think I've ever seen this bug before. 
Uh, Maybe I've just never a, observed. You, you think it's a bug though? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Someone mentioned that they think it's a mating robber fly. Mating or robber mate. flies. Yeah. Cool. Um, I don't know if I can get this person to respond, but what makes you think that it's a robber fly? Or what does mm -hmm. anyone think about it being a robber fly? And what are they seeing in this picture that makes them think robber fly? The person that asked or answered, would you like to maybe give us? Oh, says it seems familiar. It seems familiar. Okay, so there's just, you're looking at this image and you're just thinking to yourself like, hmm, this looks like a robber fly, but you can't quite put into words what exactly you're seeing in the image that might, might suggest it's a robber fly. Um, that totally happens a lot. And that's how, basically how most of us make identifications, I think. For me, when I'm looking at this image, um, and it's not just because I looked up this image and I'm fairly sure I know what it is. One thing that I'm looking at in this image is, um, A, I agree that it's some kind of insect. I'm seeing some articulated legs, what looks like, at least on the left individual, to be six legs. So that indicates that it's an insect and not something like a spider. It's got wings, spiders don't have wings. Um, but to the, to the point of whether or not it's a robber fly or some other kind of insect, one thing that I'm really keying in on is the number of wings. So a robber fly is a fly, and all flies have two wings. Um, their second pair of wings have been reduced to this, these little organs called halteres. But when you look at things that just look like wings, you basically just see two. And in this one, you can kind of see, especially on the individual on the right, um, there are sort of two big wings in the front and then two slightly smaller wings, almost half the size, um, right behind that. So that indicates that it's not some kind of fly. Um, this is actually, uh, <laughs> ironically, the name for the organism is a sawfly, even though it's not a true fly. It's in the same order as bees and wasps in Hymenoptera. And um, I believe this is one that uh, makes galls. I could be wrong, but many, many sawflies do make galls. So if you've seen um, red swellings on local willows, those are made by different kinds of sawflies. And there's many different kinds of sawflies. Um, and I, I should have looked up whether this one actually makes a gall or not. Not all of them do. Okay, I'll do this one more time. What do we think this is? Well, it definitely looks like a snake to me. Okay, what makes <laughs> it a snake? Um, I think the way that it's laying down on the ground. Um, okay. I guess it could be a close-up of a worm, too. <laughs> uh -huh. Who knows? Um, what, what's yeah. making it hard to tell? Hmm. I guess because it's blurry, for mm -hmm. one, which you probably, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. I hope everyone in the audience is, is, is kind of seeing that. Usually when I do these talks in person, someone inevitably just yells out, it's a bad photo, that's what it is. <laughs> I usually like to point out that like, it's, it's, it's maybe not the most aesthetically pleasing photo, but what's, what's significant here is that the nature of the evidence is such that it's very hard to tell exactly what it is. It's quite blurry. So there's not a lot of detail that we can see. Um, does it have tiny little legs that are hidden in the shadows that we can't see? Might that indicate that it's some kind of legless lizard and not a snake? Um, but this picture, I usually like to end on because you know all the past photos that I've been showing you all are actual INET observations. And this one, I just love to use as an example because someone posted it to iNaturalist. So for those of you who've never used iNaturalist, um, it is a website and a set of apps for sharing these kinds of observations in nature. But I like to start talking about it, um, doing what we just did, because really what it is is a set of conversations about evidence from nature. So you go out and you take a picture of a snake and you post it to the website, and that provides sort of a starting point for a discussion about what it was you saw um, and any other questions you might have about it. So each of the photos I just showed you were, were our actual photos that people reported from nature. They went outside, they were going for a hike and they saw something and they were like, cool, I'm gonna stop for a second and pay attention to this, take a picture and then share it with the internet <laughs> and see what other people think. You know, I think it's this, but maybe someone else thinks it's something else. And this particular case was a student who was going for a hike up behind Stanford, I think. And she posted this to iNaturalist um, and I think she deleted her original identification, unfortunately, but um, <laughs> she was excited about finding her first rattlesnake. She was like, cool, I finally, I finally found a rattlesnake, how exciting. And she posted this photo to the website. 
And basically the same kind of discussion ensues. You know, we talk, we say like, well, it's probably a snake. Is it a rattlesnake? Probably not. It's missing one really core detail of a rattlesnake, namely the rattle. Yeah. <laughs> I like the rattle sticker. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's an important one. But for if you don't if you don't know that about rattlesnakes, that's a very important thing to learn is to look for the rattle. That was a good indication. Other people chimed in and said, like, I don't think it has a triangular head. So that's another indication against mm -hmm. rattlesnake. But then people started talking about what it might be. You know, we're pretty sure it's a snake. Um, but what are the other kinds of snakes that look like this in this area? So people chimed in and said, I think it's a gopher snake. So people chimed in and said, like, you might want to consider juvenile yellow-bellied racer or maybe even night snake. These are all sort of small brown snakes that you might see in the area. And what's also interesting here is the nature of the people who chimed in. So the person who made the observation was a student undergraduate at Stanford, um, clearly interested in nature. So totally awesome. Getting outside in nature, to also totally awesome. Learning about snakes, also totally awesome. Um, and the people who responded to her post were this guy, Greg, who is a retired cop from Austin. Um, he's an avid naturalist and he adds identifications uh, all around the world all the time. Um, this guy, KU Psychads, is a herpetologist from um, the University of Kansas, I believe. Bob Dodge, also in the screenshot, is a local naturalist, I think at Jasper Ridge. And then further down this discussion, uh, I don't know if, don't know if I got her in the screenshot, but um, a biologist from Mid Peninsula Open Space District, which is the agency that manages this park, chimed in and said like, oh, here are some other options this could be. Probably can't tell from this photo, but definitely keep an eye out uh, the next time you're outside. So, you know, when we talk about iNaturalist, um, it is a website where you can sort of have these conversations and record this kind of information. Um, it's also a pair of mobile apps that make this kind of recording extremely easy. Um, your phone is an amazing tool for, for doing these things. Um, but I, I like to talk about it this way because at iNaturalist, we really consider ourselves, you know, stewards of a community of people, a community of naturalists who share this love for and just interest in, in nature um, and non-human organisms and recording information about them and having these discussions, talking with each other about them and learning about the natural world through this kind of shared um, communal experience that, that being in nature so often is. You know, even if, even if we go out into nature alone to experience it by ourselves, oftentimes we'll come back home and say, you know, guess what, you know, tell our friend or our spouse or whoever we might know I saw this cool thing. <laughs> and uh, that's really what iNaturalist is about, is, is telling everyone that you saw this cool thing and then sort of learning about it through discussion. So our mission at iNaturalist is to connect people to nature through technology. Um, and I wanna emphasize that because oftentimes people think about iNaturalist as, as a data system, a system for generating data. Um, and to us, the data is really byproducts. It's not the main focus. We are trying to get people outside and to care about the natural world. And we think one way of, one really good way of doing that is, is through the act of recording data because it slows you down. It causes you to stop and pay attention and think about the things that you're encountering on an individual basis. You know, don't think, it, it, it encourages people not to think of the, you know, the forest as the forest and instead to focus on individual trees and plants and organisms that might be living there. Because oftentimes, if you don't really think about or know these individual organisms by themselves, it becomes a blur. And we would like it to not necessarily be a blur. So this is our mission. Um, if you I just wanted to give a quick preview for those who have never used INET, I'm just showing some screenshots from the website. Um, every, every observation you make, every photo you post uh, should have some media evidence of what you saw. It should have coordinates that allow you to make maps like this. So this is, a, I believe this is a map of uh, butterflies in Contra Costa County. So you can see sort of where people see butterflies, where butterflies are. Um, it can serve as sort of a, a pseudo field guide because we can form these aggregate views of every sort of species that you might see in an area. So these are all the butterflies, other butterfly species that you might see in Contra Costa County or other that people have seen in Contra Costa County, um, sorted by how frequently they're observed. So people see a lot of Akpen blues and common buck guys, as I'm sure they do in Sonoma County. Um, and it can be a really great way of getting identifications if you don't know what you're looking at. Um, in addition to that kind of discussion with actual human beings, we have an automated suggestion system that uh, uses machine learning to analyze the images that you provide. 
and try to match them to uh, species that our system knows about. And it's entirely trained on, on photos that, and identifications that other people have added through iNaturalist. Um, and it's pretty good. <laughs> it's not perfect. Uh, those of you who know your plants or butterflies or any other kind of organisms can run some test images through it. And I'm sure you'll find some areas where it doesn't do so great. But for a lot of common stuff, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. And I think that's it for my preamble. Thanks so much for sharing that. I've I already learned so much just within those few minutes. Um, so you can go ahead and stop sharing once you're ready. And we have quite a bit of questions from viewers. So some of these are questions that I've even asked myself. What if I can't get a good image because the animal I saw got away too fast? Can I still record my impressions? So you can still record an observation if you didn't get a photo. Um, we do those, everyone is entitled to record those, kind of, those kinds of observations. We generally don't show them because um, in terms of verification and data quality, there's nothing for anyone else to look at, right? So like there's no evidence that other people can verify or, or even discuss. You can certainly write down what you saw. Um, and I, I personally, I use those kind of observations as kind of a notebook, you know, like I'm not expecting other people to chime in on them. Um, but if I saw something and it got away, uh, like my one mountain lion, the one mountain lion that I have ever seen, I was like fumbling with my camera and like it just jumped off the road before I was able to get a picture and I've regretted it ever since. But for that, I'm like, I did see a mountain lion. So for my own, <laughs> my own purposes, I want to get this down. I also wanted to note that um, you can add sounds to iNaturalist in addition to photos. So for birds that might be up in the canopy or hard to see, or even grasshoppers and crickets and things that are making sounds that are very easy to hear, but it's really hard to find that organism and get a decent photo, um, you can record a sound. Uh, the Android app will let you record a sound in the app. Um, for iPhone, I don't think we support that yet, but you can certainly record it with your phone and then post it at the website later. Um, yeah, that's my, that's my response to that one. Yeah. So some people often wonder, what is citizen science? Can you give us your view on that? <laughs> yeah, um, I don't like. I don't personally know. I think uh, there are a lot of different perspectives on citizen science. There are some formal definitions. Um, I, I guess I often get asked that related to iNaturalist because people often describe it as a citizen science platform, mm -hmm. and it certainly is a place where citizen science can occur. Um, I would define citizen science as any kind of scientific endeavor that involves the work of uh, non-professionals, uh, people who aren't necessarily getting paid to do it. And that, just, that is a broad definition, you know, that includes your random person who goes out and takes a photo to, you know, a highly trained scientist who just happens to be out of a job. Um, those, to me, those are all citizen science projects. They're, they're, they're basically project to passion. People are doing it not to, to draw a paycheck, they're doing it to, because they love the science or they love to, they wanna participate. There are lots of different ways to interpret the term. Um, on iNaturalist, I, I view iNaturalist I I as really more of a natural history platform. It's, it's a way to um, think about nature, to slow down and pay attention to it, like the practice of adding an observation. Um, the practice of adding identifications on the site to look at other people's contributions and voice your opinion about what you think they are is also like an educational act and a way of, if not slowing down in nature, slowing down and thinking about evidence from nature and saying like, you know, what is that plant? Do I really know that? What are the alternatives? And sort of looking up resources and trying to figure out what things are. Um, so for me, that, that's, more, that's more of what I think of as natural history. So this kind of practice that includes science but may include art may include philosophy of considering like what nature is and how humanity either is a part of it or intersects with it um and i naturalist is 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 a part of that it is certainly not the whole of natural history it is a way of thinking of it and admittedly a very geeky data driven data oriented uh way of thinking about it um but for me, as much as I, I love, you know, I'm a nerd, I love seeing those maps. Uh, I, I like thinking about the ways that organisms relate to each other evolutionarily and how that's expressed through taxonomy. Um, but, you know, for me experientially, it helps me every time I stop 
you know, I'm on the trail and I just like, I should get an observation of that. And I kneel down and I get out of my phone and I'm like taking a picture. And I'm like, oh, there's a bug on that flower. I'm like, oh, there's a mite on that bug. And like, on and on and on. And on. So for me, that, that's natural history. Like citizen science implies that there is a scientific agenda. You know, someone has a hypothesis that they are trying to test with, with data and experimental design. And INET as a whole is not necessarily that. You know, we don't have a hypothesis. We are encouraging people to get outside and, and pay attention. And as a byproduct, creating potentially usable data um, that could be used for various analytical purposes. Um, but we don't necessarily have a question that we're trying to answer on INET. Oh, well put. So what, why is it exactly important or what does it allow scientists to do? Sure. Um, so honestly, um, Scott, INAT's other co-director is great at answering that because Scott, unlike me, actually comes from the scientific world. Um, and he actually got into this because he was studying how quickly various populations respond to climate change. You know, can a pika population migrate to another mountain before it gets too hot on its mountaintop for it to survive? Or similarly with tree species, you know, can they reseed and their populations move fast enough to keep up with the shifting climactic envelope? So that involves a lot of statistics and a lot of data. And so what Scott did was sort of combine um, things that we know about the environment and shifting climate through satellite data and remote sensing with what we know about where and when organisms occur. And that usually, usually traditionally comes from museum data. So um, specimens that scientists have collected mm -hmm. and put in museums and archived and assembled all the data associated with them. And he quickly found that, you know, while we have volumes of remote sensing data about what the climate is doing, even if it's hard to interpret, we have lots and lots of data. When it comes to biodiversity and where and when organisms occur, it's a massive gap, just a huge paucity, because all we have are these individual instances where people put things in the museums. And the age of the Natural History Museum is to a large part um, diminished, vastly diminished to where it was um, basically from the 1950s uh, back into the 19th century. These days, very, very, very few natural history museums survive um, and very few new collections are being made. There's just not a lot of that data being collected. Right. So for Scott, this was a huge scientific problem because he's like, we need, we need to know, we don't know. We have no idea what's happening with biodiversity. We know we might be able to know things about like elephants because they're really big and you can see them in a satellite, mm -hmm. but we don't know anything about slender salamanders. Can't see those in a satellite. Right. Um, even using other techniques that might be more broad spectrum, like eDNA is, is pretty challenging for organisms that aren't sort of broadcasting their DNA everywhere. So, he, independent to me, came up with this idea like, well, people are taking photos all the time and sharing them on social media all the time about organisms. Like, what if we harness all these people to record this information? So that's where, that's where this kind of becomes important. So beyond, beyond my you know, personal philosophy that I want people to get outside and experience nature like I was discussing earlier, there are scientific implications in that we are filling that gap. You know, we are creating but huge volumes of data and other platforms like us, like those of you who are familiar with eBird, know that eBird generates massive amounts of data about, about birds. Um, and INAT is creating vast amounts of data, or I should say the iNaturalist community is creating vast amounts of data about basically everything else. Birds do, but um, all other organisms. So that can be used in science and is used in science. Um, those of you who are familiar with our, we do a year-end report where we have a little visualization that shows um, the papers that used INAT data in the last year. Um, there have been new species discovered using INAT data. Um, there have been many range extensions discovered using INAT data. Novel invasive species have de been detected using INAT data. Um, and all kinds of other kind of aggregate studies that just look at someone wanted to know, show me where all the you know, bats are, which is exceedingly relevant given COVID. Um, but also other diseases, bats are a reservoir from a number of different things. And, you know, when they, when you look up where, 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 where does this one species of bat occur, you usually are going to go to a, an aggregate database like the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And through that, most scientists are probably getting INET data um, because we feed data into that repository. Um, so that's kind of the broader implication of, of, of why this is important. Yeah, it's amazing work. And um, I just want to take a second to remind everyone that we have time for lots of questions and you can go ahead and drop those questions in that Q&A button below or you can drop in your questions in the comment section on Facebook. 
Um, another question that someone asked that's kind of related to the answer that you just gave and the question I asked you earlier is, um, what in your life inspired you to create this software? <laughs> I'm sure you might get that uh, quite a bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think people often fixate on origin stories a lot, but usually it's actually not phrased in terms of, of inspiration. Um, I can't not mention my parents. My parents yeah. were great, are great. Uh, they also love nature. They got me outside. We went camping. Um, my mom's always been a gardener and you know knows all the names of the plants in her garden, both the weeds and, and the stuff that she actually planted. My dad took me fishing. Um, we went camping as a family all the time. So I've, I've had a very rich, <laughs> encouraging upbringing when it comes to natural history. But uh, I also got to credit the genes. I just, I've, totally incapable of ignoring nature and have been basically my entire life. Uh, so my siblings also think nature is cool, but they're not quite as obsessive about it as I am. <laughs> so something, something went weird in my brain where I'm just sort of like, oh, I love salamanders. Like I know about salamanders. Um, but usually how I describe that is that uh, I, I grew up, I didn't grow up in California. I grew up in, in New England and I only moved here after, after college. And that was in 2003. And I, I sort of had to relearn all of the natural history that I knew because I didn't know anything about California. I got here and I'm like, your blue jays are the wrong color. What's going on? <laughs> um, so I had to just, I had to learn on my birds. I had to learn plants. I had to do all this stuff like again, except now, like as an adult in 2003, I had the internet and I had the very beginnings of social media coming together. Um, so that was kind of how I learned when I came out to California is that I took pictures of things. I posted them on the internet. I to see, tried to see if anyone could let me know what they thought they were. And, you know, I was also a web developer and I thought, you know, it would be cool to make something that ties these things together. I don't see something that's quite like that out there right now. Um, and I love maps. So let's throw some maps in there. And I had taken a uh, plant systematics course in college, basically like the year before I moved out here. And that kind of taught me about systematics and taxonomy. And so at that point, you know, I was always like, we all, obviously we have to tie this into taxonomy and use scientific names. Um, so it was iNaturalist as an idea came out of that. Um, and I, that's the specific story of, of iNaturalist, but I should say that like lots of people had the idea. It's not an original idea. There were there are many <laughs> versions of iNat out there. Um, and I think iNat's persistence is largely one of luck, you know, we just, we got lucky, you know, we happened to connect with the right people and, and make, make some decisions that help us out further on. Um, it's also a lot of work, I don't wanna discredit that. I mean, our whole team has been working on it for quite some time. Um, I've been working on it since 2008 and I've been working with Scott on it, I think since like 2010 or 2011. Um, so that's that. <laughs> I loved that answer. It's that uh, natural curiosity of nature is something that a lot of people have, and it's great to have a tool that we can all use to continue in that passion. Someone yeah, mentioned- that I, I like asking people about that because I, I had a very privileged background in that regard and that I had every encouragement to follow that. But I'm always curious about people who like came to natural history later, who sort of like didn't have that. And at some point in their life were like, I'm 37 and I just realized I love salamanders. What I do with this? <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't really, um, I grew up in um, South Central Los Angeles. So I didn't grow up with a whole lot of nature in my life. It wasn't until I was like 23, 24, where I ended up living in the back country of uh, Trinity Alps Wilderness for six months Whoa. out of my tent. And that's when like <sighs> nature just like hit me straight in the face and told me that I needed to love it. And, I followed suit. <laughs> <laughs> so someone else um, is um, wondering, and you may have gotten this question quite a bit, especially right now. Um, have you seen any interesting and diff anything interesting and different during the shelter in place orders? We have looked. Um, we haven't found too much. The problem with that is that, uh, so iNaturalist is, is growing exponentially. Every year we have way, way more activity users, observations than the year before. 
And our, our biggest time is spring in the Northern Hemisphere. So basically right as COVID hit was when our normal growth curve was like shooting up. And we've basically seen maybe a little bit less growth than we might have expected otherwise, but not too much to be totally frank. Um, so we have looked at movement patterns a little bit and we think we might be seeing a slight uh, greater trend for observations, you know, in urban areas than in the areas surrounding them relative to last year. Um, but nothing super conclusive uh, yet as, it, as far as COVID trends go. Um, and I should say that like, iNaturalist data tells us a lot about what people are interested in and where people are going. But what it tells us about what non-people, <laughs> you know, non-human organisms are doing is entirely predicated on what what the people are observing. So it's not like a, you know, a trail cam or something like that. It's providing something more like an objective view on, on what animals are doing. So if there, if there are any like changes in animal behavior, it'd be tough to notice them unless people are kind of behaving in the same way that they were behaving before. And they're probably not, but it's, it, again, it's hard to tell because of the natural, natural spring growth that we always experience. Yeah. I, I really wish I had a good, like, awesome <laughs> COVID story there, but it's, it hasn't really come together yet. And it, it, there's still time, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so quite a bit of people are asking how, about the site and how it's used. And someone just specifically asked, could you show a step-by-step -step example of using the website? And, um, Please don't leave out any steps or assume we know certain things <laughs> about operating computers. So they want a pretty detailed step-by-step -step on how to use a website. Could you provide that for us? I can try. Uh, the website is quite large and complex and there's a lot mm -hmm. of different ways to use it. Um, and I realize some people love that step-by-step -step and need the, the tutorial. I, but I, I really encourage you to just jump in and try it. And if it doesn't work, try it again. Uh, there's just, a, there's, there's two, there's more things than we can document there. But um, do you mind if I try and share my screen and see if uh, I can, I don't know, I can look at an observation or upload an observation? Sure. Yeah. I'd like to remind everyone that sometimes the best uh, way to learn things is to try it out. And you get through your mistakes, you always learn quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I think just go into it. Be ready to be ready to 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 screw up, but don't be a little bad about screwing up. Um, there's really not too much you can screw up on iNaturalist, unless you like breaking the law or something like that. Please don't break the law. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is what the iNaturalist website looks like. Um, right now, I'm looking at a view. Can you can you all see that? Always, can you see it, Maria? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so this is uh, a view of recent observations in Sonoma County, and you can view a map by clicking on this map thing. Oops, it's not gonna work. Law of demos. Yeah, I think my connection is flooded with the, the Zoom call. Well, um, would you be able to point people into maybe a video or where they could maybe get more information? Sure. So if you go to inaturalist.org uh, slash help, I think, or if it's not that, it's then it's slash pages slash help. You'll see uh, a number, a lot of different documentation. There's a page on video tutorials that you can follow to do various things. Um, that's probably the easiest way. We're also on YouTube and Vimeo, and we have a bunch of video tutorials there as well. Oh, great resource. Yeah. Uh, is this going to work? I guess I can try and walk you through uploading an observation. So. I'll go back and try and describe what I just did. So when you go to iNaturalist and after you've created an account, um, adding an observation is just sort of clicking this big green button in the header that says upload. Um, and that should land you on a page, page like this. And you can, like it says, drag and drop some files onto the screen uh, from your computer. Uh, and you can also just click the button. Um, I'm gonna add a sound. So that's what I had open. And you'll get this little card and you can say, you know, this was a Pacific Wren and I can type in, whoops, type in Pacific Wren. I can choose a date. 
and I can choose a location. So let's just pretend that I saw this in Sebastopol. That looks good. I can move this circle around. If I didn't see it in downtown Sebastopol, I could zoom in somewhere else and click elsewhere on the map. And this circle means that um, I'm sure that I saw it inside the circle and I'm sure that I didn't see it outside the circle. So this is sort of an expression of, of, of uncertainty in terms of location. So you could say like, I don't know where I was, but I was somewhere near this intersection. Um, so that looks good to me. Just click update observations. And that's basically your whole observation. So you've got some media evidence, you've got uh, identification, you've got time or a date rather and a place. Um, and then adding a photo is pretty similar. So I just click the add button. That's another way of adding things other than uh, dragging and dropping. I'm gonna go to pictures. Let's see, what's a good? I don't know, it's a weird one. Let's choose something less weird. How about this? Okay, so this is a photo that I took recently, I guess uh, a couple days ago. Um, I was getting some essential activity hiking in <laughs> and I saw this beetle. And this one, um, you can see that the location and date automatically got filled in because that data was embedded in the photo. And that's gonna depend on what your camera's doing. My camera has a GPS embedded on it, so it automatically adds coordinates. Um, almost every camera is gonna add a date to your photo, so that data should be present in the photo file itself. So that's how these automatically got filled in. Um, my process for working with photos off of my, my quote unquote good camera is that I use a separate piece of software called Lightroom to go through and add uh, tags or metadata to my photos. And I added a, a keyword tag for the scientific name of this species. And that's how the identification automatically got filled in. So if you do it that way, a lot of this stuff is pretty automated, um, but it's also totally fine to fill these things, fill these, fill these things in um, through this interface. And once you've got you know, your observations set here, you can just click submit observations and those will get posted to the website. Assuming you're not flooding your internet connection with uh, a Zoom connection. <laughs> uh, so here's my list of observations and here's that beetle that I just added. So you can see it added this name that was in the tags. You can see it added the coordinates. So I was in Chabot. Sorry, in the East Bay Anthony Chabot Regional Park. Um, and this is your observation. And I can come in here and I could say, leave the comments, like this beetle was totally awesome. Done to add my comments. I could also change my mind. Um, if I don't actually think this was tetralimonious or natural or natulus, I could just say like, you know what? I, I don't know what I'm talking about. All I really know is that this is a beetle and you can type in a new identification. You could also say that it's a beet. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's not a beet. <laughs> um, and you can type in beetle and say like, okay, all beetles are in Coleoptera. I'm just gonna choose this first option and say, maybe you leave a, a remark with your identification and say like, I'm not really sure what species this is, but I'm sure it's a beetle. And again, click done. Um, when you're adding an identific identification uh, that's sort of coarser, you're adding something of a of a of a organism that kind of contain is a category that contains something else. So this other thing that I added was a kind of beetle, and now that I'm saying like, oh, that was actually too specific, I think it's just a beetle. You're going to get prompted to say like, do you are you saying that uh, this is not this species? This species, or are you just saying? that you're not sure. So in this case, I might say, I'm not sure. And that will eventually, well, oh, wow. I already got an identification while we well, were doing this. Fast. <laughs> <laughs> I, this, this guy added an identification. So um, this is interesting. This, this individual, B. Matheson, is actually a specialist in the family Elateridae. He's a, he's a specialist in a particular group of beetles. He's been adding a lot of identifications on iNaturalist recently. So 
I should say that, you know, like a one to two minute turnaround is not typical on INET, but this guy is particularly <laughs> avid and is adding a lot of identifications of elaterids. Um, so in this case, uh, this is a good chance to talk about our community taxon system. So we have multiple opinions here, right? So I have said that it's a beetle and he has said that it's the specific beetle. In this case, I didn't disagree with anything. I'm just expressing my opinion. So the system says, okay, that's one vote for beetle and then one vote for this thing that is a kind of beetle, but much more specific. So INAT will say, all right, we're gonna go with that species level thing until someone else contradicts it. Um, so this is the, the organism, the observation taxon is now associated with the species. And then the community taxon is a slightly different concept. The community taxon is meant to be, what is the aggregate opinion? So right now, the aggregate opinion is basically beetles. We have two opinions. They both are beetles. One, it just happens to be more specific, but the conservative consensus view is that it is a beetle. If someone else comes in and adds the same uh, identification, or I can just do that. I can say like, you know what? I changed my mind. B. Matheson is right. I agree. This is Tetralimonius ornatulus. That is eventually, again, if I was not having, there we go. That changed the community tax onto the species. So now there's only two votes. They're both for the same thing. Um, so the community tax on shifted over to that species. And you'll also see that it's now quote unquote research grade. That means that it is complete. It's got photo, location, date, um, but it also has a more than one person opinion about what it is and they all agree. And it's at species level. So I don't know if that was, I could go on and on and on about all the different ways to use INET. Um, I don't know if that was step-by-step step enough for uh, the, the question asker, but I encourage you to check out the videos uh, that, I, that I mentioned. There's uh, a lot of things, different, different things covered. Yeah, that, that was pretty in-depth. And of course, uh, people could always check out the INAT website to find out more information. And I, I just love to see the community already in action as we were <laughs> going through the website there. It's gonna vary a lot by different, you know, it depends on who's out there adding identifications. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. there's a lot of birders. If you add a bird, you're gonna get a response very, very quickly. Probably a lot of responses. Um, there's a lot of like snake folks. People are super into snakes, um, but plants are tougher. You know, there's a lot more plants. And honestly, most of the plants that people post to INAT are your backyard potted plants um, or your common cultivated stuff. Cause especially now that we're all stuck at home, that's what's around. Yeah. Um, and I think most people that are super interested in adding identifications on INAT are not really that interested in those things. And INAT is actually a little bit predicated against, uh, biased against them. Um, when you mark something as captive, that, that takes it out of that quote unquote research grade pool, which means that we won't be sharing that observation outside of INAT. It's, can, it's still a valid observation, but we don't share that. Um, generally, we're more interested in getting people outside and looking at wild natural things than um, human mediated uh, cultivated things. But honestly, cultivated things can also be super biologically interesting. And there's lots of critique of our policy there um, about what is and isn't research grade and what doesn't, what is and isn't valid data for research because of all kinds of interesting research you could do about cultivated plants and where they're surviving, what kind of insects they're hosting. Um, so that's a, a larger semantic argument. But um, yeah, it's gonna vary how quickly, a how quickly you get a response based on sort of what you provided um, and also the, the nature of the evidence you provide. Oh yeah, I forgot. I put together some slides on like recording good observations. Do we wanna segue into Oh that? yeah, definitely. Love to sure. get some pointers. Are there any other burning questions that I should be answering before we get to that? Well, there was one where some, and it's kind of related to what you just <laughs> <laughs> said yeah. they were wondering if um, they can make a personal folder on the website so that they could, um, for example, catalog all of the plants and other species in their garden. Yeah, so a lot of people do this. Um, the probably we don't have folders, but we have these things called projects. Um, the real I should just get to the sticky part of this first, which is that like iNatural is public. We are all about sharing information publicly. Um, and you may not want the location of your house and everything you're seeing around your house to be public. So if that's a concern to you or a major concern to you, definitely consider that. Um, and INAT might not be the best tool for doing it. Uh, I do it. I have a little project for my house. And what you can do to address that is you can choose to change the, the geo privacy of an observation. So there's a setting when you upload that says, um, 
you know, do you want to obscure the coordinates? So what that means is that we'll show publicly, show the location that you recorded as a randomly chosen location within a two degree uh, cell, two degree latitude longitude cell of your observation, um, which provides some degree of location security. It can be hard to guess exactly where, where it is. Um, so if you wanted to do that, you would go to INAT, you would make a, a project, um, I would make a quote unquote traditional project, which it means that you have to manually add all your observations to it. And then for every, every time you record something in your yard or around your house, you would add that observation to the project and you'd be sure to um, change the coordinates so that they are uh, private or obscured. Great. Um, it's do you a little bit move? convoluted. Yeah. <laughs> But it's an answer nonetheless. <laughs> um, do you yeah. want to move into um, some tips on um, good op on making good observations? Sure. Um, <laughs> I'm afraid the answer it's a little convoluted applies to a whole lot of AI naturalists, but uh, <laughs> such such is life. I will say that the you know the generally the practice of of keeping things trying to be public, but having some things like pseudo private is is quite difficult. Um, and doesn't always work the way that, that we want to. Okay, so general tips for using the app. Usually when I'm using, doing an event in which we're all going out to use the app, I show something like this, which is um, if you don't, so before I walked you through using the website, sometimes the apps are a lot easier to use. Um, installing it is just a matter of going to the app store on your iPhone or the Play Store on your Android device and searching for iNaturalist, uh, which should be the top result. Um, do watch out for ads. A lot of other companies seem to advertise based on our keywords, like our name. <laughs> so sometimes picture this or plant snap or something like that will show up uh, even when you search for iNaturalist. Um, but so install the app, uh, create an account. Uh, I highly encourage people to create a novel account and not log in with Facebook or Google, even though that's definitely easier. Um, it's there as a convenience, but then you create this dependency on your Facebook or Google account, and that can create problems later on. If you already have an account, you can log into the app. And then when you're in the app, all you need to do to observe is um, in the iPhone, that's what I'm showing here, you just tap the observe button in the footer, and then in the Android app, there's a big green plus button, and you just tap that, and that should get you going. Uh, I will say that, I don't know if I have this here, you will be prompted to um, grant some permissions and I know a lot of people reflexively say no every time an app says, can I access your location? Everyone says like, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, you cannot have any of my data. Please say yes for iNaturalist. <laughs> if the app practically does not work at all if you don't grant permis uh, permission to use your location and your camera. Um, the whole experience is predicated around taking pictures. So if you don't grant it access to your camera, it's not gonna work very well. Uh, yeah, these are examples basically from the iPhone. Um, and then, yeah, when I'm doing an event, I usually like to point out that you don't have to use the app, you know. <laughs> if you have a camera, you can take pictures and upload them later. Uh, another important thing is that you don't have, if you don't have internet, the app should work fine without internet. Um, your GPS should work fine without internet. Your camera should work fine without internet. The only sticking point there is that you should remember to upload your observations later. When you get back to um, either cell reception or Wi-Fi, you can up, you should upload upload then. Um, another good pointer is that uh, you might want to go into the settings and turn off auto upload. That allows you to choose when you upload. So you're going to be uploading a lot of photos. That might be a lot of bandwidth. If you're paying uh, for a cellular plan where you're paying by amount uploaded, that that could be unpleasant. <laughs> so that's a good setting to disable. And if you're planning on recording a lot of observations. I definitely have that turned off because I'm usually out of cell reception a lot and I just upload everything when I get home to Wi-Fi. Uh, when you're recording an observation, there are kind of different schools about whether or not you should be identifying at all if you don't know what it is. Um, but my, my advice is usually to be as specific as possible. That way, you know, if you see a plant, and you don't know what it is, even if you just say plant, that helps plant experts find your observation. So people are searching for plants. And if you don't add any identification, the people searching for plants won't find your observation. So try to be as specific as possible. If all you can do is plants, that's totally cool. If you can do like genus Solanum, 
or you know, it's a squash or something like that, that's even more helpful because experts in those fields might only be searching for, for those kinds of parameters. Oh, I put this auto upload thing here too, good. And yes, just to reiterate, please say yes to all the permission points. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, taking, taking identifiable photos, and I had good crossed out here because a lot of people fixate on taking a, a good or aesthetically pleasing photo when using iNaturalist. You got to throw that out the window. <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes an aesthetically pleasing photo is totally not helpful for get, helping other people identify what you saw or demonstrating or proving, you know, using your photo as evidence of what you saw. Sometimes you have to take an ugly picture. Um, in general, it's great advice to take multiple pictures. So when you're recording an observation in the app, you can attach multiple photos to your observation. Once you land on the observation editing page, you'll see uh, an add another photo button. You can just tap that, add another photo to your observation. Try to get multiple angles of your subject. This is especially important for plants because this photo on the left might not help you identify this because you can't quite see um, critical things about the flower too. You know, maybe you can't see something on the top down view. So usually when I'm looking at a flower that I don't know, I'll try to get that top down view. I'll try to get a side view. I'll try to get a picture of the leaves. Um, I'll often try to get a picture of the whole plant. Sometimes the shape of the whole plant is, is diagnostic. Um, and again, I, I think the photo on the left here is, is, is pretty looking, but the other two are sort of like, eh, I would, not, I would not frame those other two photos. But they're providing interesting and potentially useful data about what I saw. Another thing I usually encourage people to do, um, actually, this is another example of multiple photos. If you just took this photo, you know, you might be able to say, it's a tree, you know, it's a vascular plant. Uh, it kind of looks like an oak, I guess, but- It's pretty. <laughs> sort of hard to be sure. Um, but when you zoom in and you get these multiple angles and you start seeing features of the underside of the leaf, you know, this applies to like anything. If it has multiple sides, like try to get both sides, if they're, especially if they're different. Um, these things can really help. Uh, this one I think is about scale. Sorry, the Zoom UI is, is covering some things. Um, but yeah, scale is really important. Uh, I know there are a lot of people generally and on INET who don't like seeing people's fingers in photos, but I love getting my fingers in photos because I kind of know what size my fingers are. <laughs> so if an organism is safe to touch or uh, safe to have my hand close to, uh, I usually don't have a ruler with me. So that just gives some indication to other identifiers and to myself in the future if I want to go back and, you know, you know, was this finger sized or was this like arm sized? That can be a really useful distinction. Um, if you do have a ruler or you carry a ruler with you, that's even better. You know, you're providing some quantitative scale for how big something was or not. I usually like to use this as an example. This is like a terrifying looking critter that lives here in the Bay Area. It could be around you right now, um, but it's very small, <laughs> very small. What bug uh, is this? Sli it's slightly less terrifying. This is a kind of harvest man called Ortholasma rugosum. I don't think it has a common name. Um, I like to call it Satan's pancake flipper because it has this weird pancake flipper like thing on its nose. I think of unknown function um, and it looks kind of demonic, which is part of why I like it. Uh, but I, I, I love these things, I love finding them. Uh, Another really good tip is to try and fill the frame with your subject. So if you see the photo on the left on the website, even if you can zoom in on it and see what it looks like on the website, a lot of people are just gonna pass it by because they're gonna say, oh, I don't know, there's not enough detail there for, for me to make it out. But if you as the photographer crop it on your subject, then someone perusing the site can say like, oh yeah, I think I know that bird. That, that's something I can, I can identify. So it's helpful to get people's attention in that way by cropping in and, and showing the detail. But I will say it can also be helpful to, to include all of these shots. You know. The one on the left is providing some context. That can tell you what kind of tree it was in, which might be useful. Maybe that the bird likes a certain kind of tree and, and doesn't like another. So if you can fill the frame, um, but definitely the context shots can help too, as long as the organism is in the photo. Um, I do like to provide some tips on, on not just recording on observations, but also identifying and participating in the community. Um, the best thing you can do to, to, to help out iNaturalist if you think that we're doing something good is to just try it and use it, um, record some observations, add some identifications. Uh, identifying is something you can do right now. You just have to sign on and, and check it out. Um, if it's not for you, you should just tell someone about it. If you know someone else who's, who's really into it. 
if you are an expert in something, um, even if you're not, you know, if you just, if you can tell a, a plant from a mushroom, that can be helpful. We have lots of observations that have no identification on the site. So you can provide that service of, you know, siphoning those observations to people who are specializing in plants and mushrooms by adding those kinds of course identifications. Um, I will say that if you are an expert, be nice. <laughs> don't, don't berate people with your expertise. Uh, try to be open uh, to the possibility of being wrong. And if people are asking you questions, please try to respond with information. And you know, responses like, I'm an expert and that's why what it, it is what it is are not acceptable on iNaturalist. If someone asks you a question, we're expecting you to say like, I think it's this because this, because I'm seeing this in the evidence and not because I am who I say I am. Most important thing, have fun. If that's not fun, don't bother. It's not a mandatory thing, you know. If you're not enjoying it, don't do it. Um, but if you are doing it, enjoy. <laughs> that's my little. That's my little tutorial. I love that. <laughs> I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today. It looks like we're just about running out of time. I do apologize to everyone that uh, we did not get a chance to answer questions to or answer their questions. Um, so. Uh, you could also, can you choose, is there a way that um, some of their questions could be answered on your website? Would you say maybe just uh, looking on the help section for um, answers there? De definitely have the, check out the help section. If you have specific questions like technical issues, um, check out our forum, that's forum.inaturalist.org. Um, that's a great way to get help, uh, both from the community and from, from staff. Um, we also have a help email address, help at inaturalist.org if you have specific questions. Um, but the website has, an, has answers to a lot of those things. We have an FAQ that has many answers. I've also done two Reddit AMAs in which many, many, many questions have been asked. Um, and there's lots of good stuff there if you're willing to wade through Reddit. Um, <laughs> so that can be a fun way to get, get answers to stuff too. Great. Thank you so much for your time today and uh, giving us so much insight. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's really great to, to talk about INET and I hope everyone's enjoying the outdoors. Thanks. Like many of you, Sonoma Land Trust cares deeply about nature. Our mission is to protect the natural lands of Sonoma County for everyone's benefit. And as a nonprofit organization, we rely on donations from individuals, businesses and foundations to make our work possible. If you're already a donor, I'd like to personally thank you. Um, the donations that you make make the work that I love doing possible. And if you're not, I encourage you to consider donating and be part of protecting nature forever. You can find out how to donate and learn about future programming on our webpage. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So that concludes our presentation for today and until next time, stay wild. <laughs>